So I started actually looking in the Word just a little bit about shaking, and I'm just going to hit a couple of high points. Acts chapter 4 really stuck out to me is when they, the church was going through some persecution. Understand, persecution is ramping up. Amen? The fact that you're a Christian, the fact that you believe what you believe is ramping up to a time of hostility in our current cancel culture. All right? But Acts chapter 4 shows that the, the early apostles were no stranger to cancel culture. And they wanted to cancel them by killing them. All right? So they healed a guy. And God started doing miracles, and suddenly they're running for their lives. And they get together in Acts chapter 4, and they pray. And when they pray, again, prayer is going to be a key, uh, a key foundation point in this season of shaking. But when they prayed, it says, when they had prayed, the place that they were in was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, understand, they were filled before, but how many understand we've got to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit? And then it said, and great grace and great power was upon them. Mega dunamis in Greek. Mega dunamis, mega power, mega charis, grace and favor. Lift your hands up. The Lord says, I'm releasing mega dunamis, mega grace, mega power, so that you can go out and be even more bold to represent the kingdom of God, even more bold in doing signs and wonders, even more bold in setting captives free wherever you go. Say, I'll do it. I also think about Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas. I'm talking about things that maybe aren't the best of situations. Paul and Silas found themselves in prison. Why? Because they cast the devil out of a slave girl. And that deliverance actually cost her master's money. So in Acts chapter 16, we find Paul and Silas in the prison. And then at midnight, they begin to sing. They begin to worship. Here we see that praise and worship is going to be something that carries us through this next season. Not just prayer, but praise and worship is going to actually carry us into a new place. And as they praise and as they worship, God sent an angel down. And it shook the whole prison. And all their bondages broke off of them. And they actually came into a place of freedom. Amen? Good things ended up happening after the shaking. We think about Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. We sing a song here, graves to gardens, bones to armies. How many believe God can turn bones to armies? That's my favorite line of that whole song. I love it. God will turn bones to armies. How does he do that? If you read it, the prophet comes and prophesies to the valley of dry bones. And he says, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And in response, what happened is the dead dry, scattered bones began to shake. By the way, the phrase dry bones in Hebrew actually comes from the conver convergence of three words, shame, disappointment, and confusion. God wants to shake every place of shame, every place of disappointment, and every place of confusion. God breathed his breath in. He shook the bones, and the bones made a lot of noise. Get ready for a lot of noise, right? Y'all don't seem very excited about this word. <laughs> Let me tell you, after the shaking, the bones came together and they stood up on their feet as an exceeding great army. This is what God is after. He's not just looking for people that play Christianity or that like casual Christianity or feel good Christianity. He wants, he's looking for an army that says, God, what is my assignment? God, what is my mission? God, what is my territory? What is it that you've got me to do? God, you've got an assignment for this army. Bones to army. You might feel like you've been dry bones. I'm telling you, God's turning you into an army. Amen? And something else I discovered is that olive trees, the way you harvest olives is that they shake the tree. They shake the tree and the olives fall. And olives then get pressed to produce oil. Psalms 92, 10 says, you have anointed me with fresh oil. Shaking brings awakening. In the first two great awakenings, which were some of the greatest times of harvest and revival in this nation and different nations, it was preceded by some of the darkest times economically, politically, socially, 
Relationally, we were a divided nation before the First Great Awakening, before the Revolutionary War. We were a divided nation in the Second Great Awakening before the Civil War. I'm not saying this has to result in a war, but let me just say there's already a war going on. It's in the spirit, it's in the media, it's in the culture, and there's a lot of darkness in the earth, but it's in those times of darkness that God loves to bring an awakening. Amen? We are in the perfect time for God to bring an awakening. And so I want us to just look for just a second at the, the positioning of being an ambassador. If the Lord says that he's going to anoint us to be ambassadors of peace in the midst of the shaking, I believe we need to understand what that is going to mean. And the first thing I want to say is that we're going to be kingdom ambassadors, not ambassadors for ourselves, but kingdom ambassadors. And we sang about this all through worship, but I just want to point out that when Jesus came to the earth and when he launched in to his time of earthly ministry, about a third of the time he was healing the sick, about a third of the time he was casting out devils, and about a third of the time he was preaching not the gospel of salvation, but the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus didn't just come saying, I want to save you from your sins. I mean, there are a couple of scriptures that talk about the gospel of salvation, but more what he was saying is, I want to give you salvation, which is the door of entrance into a whole new kingdom that you can become citizens of. And God is saying to his church, we must get a kingdom mentality. This is why Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my legislative body, my army. Those are words that ecclesia means. My ruling class. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. He wasn't talking about this building. He was talking about us. We are the ecclesia. I want you to say, I am the ecclesia. I am the ruling class. I know some, that was hard for some of you. Listen to what he said. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. That whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Another translation says it this way. Whatever you forbid will be forbidden. Whatever you allow will be allowed. Come on, church. What are we forbidding and what are we allowing? There's a whole lot of stuff going on right now. I don't know how many of you have seen this video that was made by a homosexual choir, and the name of the song was, We're Coming for Your Children. I forbid it in the name of Jesus. Come on, we've got to start. We don't hate people, but we hate an agenda. We hate agendas, and we stand against agendas, and we bring a kingdom agenda that wants to set everybody free. Amen? 